Cocaine Cowboys, The Deadly Rise of Ireland's Drug Lords, the live show is on sale now. We're on the road on February 10th at the Lime Tree Theatre in Limerick, February 15th in Cork's Everyman Theatre and on Sunday 18th we're back at Dublin's Three Olympia. April takes us to Galway's Town Hall Theatre, Killarney's INEC and Belfast's Waterfront Studios. Check mcd.ie or venue for ticket sales. If you, if you don't come out and start fighting, what? Other people are going to start falling victim. You fucking what? I'm telling you, I come out and fight like a man. Other than that, give it two more days, one more, and watch. All right, I'm driving around. I'll give you one more day, one more day, to let me knock the fucking bollocks out here. You run your friends, you run your friends. So that was the voice of uh, Bernard Fogarty, the late Bernard Fogarty. And it was during a really chaotic time in his life, scary time in his life, when he was using social media to intimidate people. He was pretty much driving around the city like, you know, a wild card, was yeah. capable of doing anything, was hanging out with another very notorious criminal who we can't name at the moment because he's facing some serious charges. But between them, they were a very formidable duo and there was a kind of a real anxiousness to get them off the streets, particularly Fogarty. I mean, you can see the kind of the possibly mental health issues he has going on there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like it was, I mean, he was effectively recording himself admitting to crimes. I mean, it was quite bizarre yeah. if you look back in it. Like he was openly threatening to kill people, intimidate people, saying he was phoning this person up. I mean, you can't... Like they are actual <laughs> criminal offences. Yeah. So he was uploading these things and putting them up. And then he seemed to be engaging with people on social media as they were making comments. I mean, it was very, very, I can't can't think of anybody else who's done it. Now we've written and you've spoken about it many times about people, gangs using social media, but it's all anonymous accounts. I mean, Bernard Fogarty was putting his own head in it. And yeah. it's clearly... Uh, well, he was literally driving around the streets and he was pulling in every now and then in his car and he was yeah. literally having this rant, like, yeah. quite amazing, but talking quite normally one minute and the next thing you yeah. get into, you could see the anger rising yeah. in him and he'd be spitting flames yeah. about how he was going to find these people and he was going to kill them and he was going to do yeah. this, that and the other. And I mean, out of control isn't the word for it, the word that he was at that point. Yeah, time. I mean, if he didn't know better, he would have thought he was an absolute muppet who was yeah. just playing up to the camera. But of course, that wasn't the case because he was a killer. Yeah. And he was a good man and he's he's he was he was found dead this week, obviously, in a cell in Port Leash prison. And he was at that time he was serving a life sentence for the brutal murder of a dad of eight, um, Barry Wolverson. And he was also uh, had already uh, earlier earlier last year nowadays uh, pled guilty to the attempted murder of another man, um, Mark Ivers, um, in uh, what was uh, another gangland shooting. And um, so he was awaiting sentencing on that, having already pled guilty. So he was facing a, a very very lengthy time in prison. And when you looked at those videos, you know you would have thought. Like, yeah, it looked like a, some sort of Egypt. Yeah. But he was a dangerous, dangerous man. Yeah. So it was May 2023 um, when he was jailed by the Special Criminal Court in relation to the shooting um, of, that was of Mark Ivers. He had yeah. previously been found guilty of the shooting, uh, sorry, of, of killing Barry Wolverson. Yeah. Now that man was in a sort of a car repair yard yeah. and Fogarty and another man had come yeah. along um, there was a dispute over money they said yeah um, Wolverson actually survived the shooting yes for over a year yeah lived on life support it was really tragic um, he was essentially I think had lost all his faculties he was in a really bad condition um, now Sometimes when that happens, there's complications when it comes to trial as regards whether somebody is murdered or whether they die from their um, their medical yeah, injuries. issues yeah. as such, you know. Um, but in, in the case of Wilverson, they were both the two individuals in this case were convicted of, of murder. Yeah, I mean, I think his injuries were so catastrophic as a result of the shooting. The fact that he died a year later of of complications, um, you know, it was clear how, where those complications had originated. 
um, the two men were tried for murder. Um, a clear motive was never revealed, really. Um, but what had been revealed was their movements in the aftermath, um, you know, then buying certain things that were used as part of covering up the murder in terms of uh, fuel to set the car on fire. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, they were convicted of, of murder, sentenced to life. And, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Fogarty was, because of the other, the, the attempted murder then came at a later point and he pled guilty at a relatively early stage. That shooting uh, was carried out as part of the tensions involving a series of of, of feuds, I suppose, in Kulak, where uh, Bernard Fogarty had played a, a role. However, him and his, his, his accomplice, I suppose you could call him, they probably weren't regarded as being a clear member of any particular criminal organisations. Um, what they were, were involved in the drugs business, certainly, and um, Fogarty's accomplice had, had been caught with a large amount of cocaine, but they were offering, also offering their services as gunmen for hire, and they were also acting as enforcers. And as a result of all of these activities, they seemed to be willing to take on almost anybody at any level. Mm -hmm. um, very, very uh, dangerous criminals. I remember um, speaking to somebody close to Barry Wilverson at the time that he had died, and they spoke about the kind of the battle that he had put up. Uh, it was 13 months, I think, from memory that he had lived and he was in a sort of a catatonic state. They described it as in a nursing home and he was being cared for um, as his wife and his children kind of prayed for miracles. But he had sort of lived through three waves of COVID. Yeah, We, we kind of forget what that must have been like for people who had somebody so vulnerable. Um, and he tacked long to life, albeit a shadow of the one he yeah. once had. Um, and, you know, there was this sense of utter tragedy when he had died. I mean, I suppose if somebody lives that long, yeah. you kind of have this uh, hope that yeah. maybe they will, you know, they will recover, open their eyes one day, maybe speak to you, whatever. Um, but the, the people close to him described him as sort of a doting father. He's a complicated uh, personal life, maybe. But that... He was absolutely adored by all his children yeah. and, and by everybody around him. And that um, this shooting, they described it as being totally unnecessary, that they felt it was almost, you know, a measure of the mental state that Fogarty and his accomplice were in at that time. Yeah. Because they were literally driving around, threatening people all over the place. Exactly. And um, obviously the, the in the aftermath of, of Mr. Wolverson's death, um, there, or after a shooting, there was a. They were the, the, both of those men were charged with attempted murder before it was upgraded to murder following his death. But in that run up to that long run up to the trial, um, Fogarty continued to threaten people uh, to do with the case, continued to attempt to intimidate people who may have interacted with the guardie, and um, continued to uh, phone people up and issue threats. Uh, and which was obviously extremely difficult for the family. Um, so they were r relentless and remorseless, I suppose. Um, and as I said, they were acting as these gun for hire. They had associations with the, the Kinnan cartel uh, and people involved in the Kinnan cartel, but they they were probably too erratic to be regarded as being uh, full <laughs> members of any gang. They were just headbangers. Uh, Total. And Fogarty clearly was a prolific drug user. Yeah. I mean, many would say that, you know, you take too much coke, it rots the brain. Yeah. And I think in regard to him and others, you can kind of see that yeah. psychosis. You know, it's a complete um, break with the reality that has happened. Um, he continued using drugs behind bars. Yeah. And... Was he fighting? Was he threatening people there? Do we know he was in Borlish? So it was obviously... No, I mean, he was, he was, yeah, he was all in, in with some of the, the real uh, gangland heavy figures, so heavy hitters. So I don't think he was able to throw his weight around within the prison system in the way that he might have done on the outside. I mean, funnily enough, like Bernard Fogarty, uh, I, I was talking to somebody who had known him as a sort of young, young teenager, and said he wasn't one of these uh, sort of hard men. Uh, he wasn't one of these guys who stood out as going to be dangerous and with connections and these people that seem almost inevitably going to end up at the top of criminal organisations. 
and that although he was involved in this and that, that he was more regarded as a bit of a Egypt, like a bit, mm. of a, you know, not not one of the not one of those guys that it, that that it was blindingly obvious what he was going to end up with. Not one of those uh, sort of cold hearted, dangerous people. But um, he clearly as well, like it's unusual those videos, obviously because. If you're going around saying I'm going to kill you, like you can be charged, just as simple as that. But it's also like I suppose it's it's he seemed to revel in the attention that it generated. Um, he was the sort of a like a, a what would you call him? Um, you know, an influencer was he a guy? Well, well, no, exactly. He was. He was. He. I felt he was. Well, he certainly enjoyed the the attention. I mean, yeah. that's and and. Obviously, um, then he was continued to be, while he was facing very serious charges, um, he was still carrying out uh, very violent crimes. I mean, he was obviously suspected of, of, and I think he had been arrested for that attempted murder of Mark Ivers, but it was while he was, uh, in four months after that, I think it was Barry Wolverson's murder occurred, and he remained on bail at a period of time after that, and he was continued to be involved in violent incidents. Um, at one stage, I think, was caught with a, a, a relatively small amount of heroin and um, had been involved in a sort of confrontation with police as well, I think. So he, he even though he remained under investigation, he was still out and causing absolute chaos. And if he obviously, both him and his accomplice were at that point in, in the sort of general Kulak area and the surrounding areas, there was a number of... Um, a number of shootings, uh, a, a large amount of violence. There was feuds and sub feuds and interconnected feuds all springing up, and uh, they were a really volatile part of that whole mix. Mm -hmm. um, They're the, exactly the kind of guys that the police like to see getting off the streets and kind of coming out of that sort of already, yeah, um, difficult uh, feuding. Yeah, because because, he, because if once they have come out of it, yeah. in, in fairness, and and maybe a couple of others, things have have certainly there's been a a, a lot less public viol or violent yeah. reports. Um, so he died in prison. Uh, there is no suspicion surrounding his death. It's no. it's, it's uh, not been treated as suspicious, but nonetheless, there will be a coroner's court. So an investigation will be. Uh, conducted by the Gardaí for the coroner's court and a separate investigation by the Irish Prison Service to to consider how um, somebody dies within the care of the state and in a cell. Yeah, and of course there, there, there are a number that's every every year in the prisons, prison system. Um, every one of them is investigated thoroughly, um, you know, and the prison service, in fairness, uh, you know, they, they, they look into them in, in great detail and see how they can be avoided. Obviously, prison is really difficult if if you're looking at somebody like Bernard Fogarty who has, um, although he wasn't sentenced for that attempted murder, he could have faced a, another life sentence. He's already facing a life sentence um, with no uh, guilty plea or anything like that. People like in his position could face, would face at least two decades in prison, um, if not more, you know, um, obviously, as we said before, life sentences, it's an undeterminate sentence, but he, he would have, he was 35, he would have, you know, realistically would have been in his mid to late fifties before he had any chance of seeing freedom. And only, even only at that point would that would have come with um, a degree of, of, of rehabilitation and he would have had to show that. So as a lot of interest, we spoke initially about some of those clips are being reshared now. Yeah, so, you know, his legacy essentially lives on social media. Yeah. People are putting those out again. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, they are putting them out and um, it's, it, look, again, it shows that curious uh, mix that, that we live in um, and we can see this all the time now. Uh, social media and gangland crime, not just in Ireland, uh, we see it in Mexico and all parts of, I think there was, I saw a story recently about Romanian gangsters uh, on TikTok. It's just become embedded in that culture and it's a way of spreading you know, but Bernard Fogarty, I suppose. I'm showing off your wares because I remember yeah. Fogarty at one point going in and he was big into his shades, wasn't he? He liked his designer yeah. glasses and yeah. he was going in and showing, you know, how he could afford the uh, the more bling, the better, I think. Yeah. And he would show off what he was going to wear. Yeah, his ray bands or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, he was in a sense, he was ahead of his time in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but 
Look, I mean, it, it was a, if you look at these guys, uh, he, he's a classic example of, if you want to call it, and I don't mean to diminish the victims of his crime, but it was a brief moment of glory for him. And that was that. Yeah. You know, his, his, his moment of glory was on TikTok for about six months. And then he was facing a, a very, very long period of time behind bars. With, where it doesn't matter what sunglasses you're wearing. No, exactly. Okay. Well, we leave it at that. Ken Sickler. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.